these meetings and in this process, district, but they've talked about the citywide effect. They've talked about how this is going to affect the future of New York City for generations. Three of the folks that are standing here today uh, are term limited from the city council. And one of the folks who's standing here today uh, is not term limited, but all of them have been brave in how they've handled this. And I am so incredibly proud of them. I am proud of how they have been able to really think about what their legacy is going to be, not what votes are going to happen in the next election, not what stories will be written on the day of or the day after, but what will be written about them 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. This is what we are doing here today. We are closing a penal colony in the East River which symbolizes inhumanity and brutality. We cannot solve all of the world's problems in today's vote. That is not possible. I wish we could, but we are doing something very, very significant here today. And we are not just building new facilities to house incarcerated people. We are announcing over $300 million in investments today in housing, in mental health, in restorative justice, in supportive housing, in transitional beds. This is not just about making the facilities better, though that is important. It's about getting to the root of the problem of mass incarceration and ensuring that people coming off of Rikers Island or out of state prisons are able to reintegrate back into society and get the support they need. Mass incarceration is a failure and has been a stain on the United States of America and the city that we love. And the four people standing here today over the last many years have thought about this, have been substantive and compassionate. They've met with formerly incarcerated people. They've met with people in their community. I am so incredibly proud of all of them. What we are doing today is a good thing. Let's not get twisted, as Vanessa Gibson said yesterday. Let's not get twisted. And let's not be loose with the facts. You cannot make the existing facilities in downtown Brooklyn, the Barge, or in Lower Manhattan humane. They are irredeemable buildings. They are worse than Rikers Island. They must be torn down so we can have facilities that will actually hopefully help rehabilitate people when they are in custody. So I want to thank you, Diana. I want to thank you, Karen. I want to thank you, Margaret, and I want to thank you, Steve, for your courage, your bravery, and for doing the right thing in the face of a difficult moment in a difficult past two years. And the first person that I want to call up is someone who I, I love very much and someone who has uh, just been a real brave warrior throughout all of this. I want to call up Councilmember Diana Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, I adore you as well. And I want to just before anything, I want to thank my colleagues who have been true warriors and who have supported us. You know, we've supported each other, but they've supported me as a freshman coming in brand new last year, two months in, when I got a call asking if I would consider taking this facility in my, in my district. I'm not going to lie and say that it was the easiest decision, but I'm, not gonna, I'm also not going to lie and say that I've lost any sleep over it because I know in my heart that I'm doing the right thing. Um, many of you have probably heard, I think I've mentioned this several times, I have a little brother that um, I helped raise who has been in and out of Rikers Island since he was actually, he started off at Spofford at the age of 11 and graduated to Rikers at the age of 16. My baby brother, who I love tremendously, has spent most of his life in and out of the prison system and most specifically in and out of solitary confinement. He suffers from severe bipolar disorder today as a result of his years of confinement. But what I remember the most, and I think one of the things that sticks with me and will forever stay with me is the guilt of knowing that because my mother was a single mother with very limited resources. We didn't have a vehicle or anyone to drive us to Rikers Island. And we had very little way to get to the island that while he was there, he was there alone. He didn't have the support of a family to love him, to support him through this. And we abandoned him. We abandoned him as a community. We abandoned him as a city. We abandoned him as a family. And we have to live with the consequences of that. 
And so we can't sit here and say that we don't support the separation of families when we do that every single day by continuing to keep people on an island that is just not accessible to families, the neediest of families. We can't do that and we won't do that. We cannot continue to flood dollars of our public dollars into public defenders that our constituents can't even access. And so I know that I'm doing the right thing. I try to do the best by both. I represent everybody in my community. I represent the people that live there, the working class, the, the low income resident. I represent the person who's suffering from chemical dependency, the person who has mental illness, the homeless person on the bench. I represent them all. And so I weighed all of that in my decision today. And I stand here proudly and unafraid because I cannot allow myself to be bullied. I have a public charge to do the right thing by my community and I think that that is what I'm doing and I do that proudly. So I thank my speaker who has been a tremendous support for having the bravery. Two years ago we said that we were going to do that and today we're delivering on that promise and I'm really, really excited to be here. So thank you all for coming and I look forward to your questions. <coughs> I want to... <coughs> Uh, next, I want to call up <clears throat> uh, one of my closest friends, uh, someone who has uh, the longest serving member of the New York City Council, and I am very proud of her courage and bravery throughout this entire process, Councilmember Karen Kozlowitz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to save my, most of my remarks for today at the stated, but I just want to say <clears throat> that it's a humane thing that we're doing today. I have been to Rikers. I have been to the Kew Gardens Jail. They weren't cells, they were cages where people were put. 80% of the people have not been convicted yet and they're treated like animals. This has to stop. There was a jail in Kew Gardens there were over 500 inmates in Kew Gardens with very little effects to the community, if any. I think that this facility being built is a facility that's going to help people to readjust. Yesterday at the land use, uh, one of the land use hearings, I sat in front of a row of people that were at Rikers Island. And you know, if I ever had a question in my mind about what to do, I just had to look at their faces on the reaction of comments that were being made. They're out of jail, but the pain that they got in jail is still with them. So how can we be inhuman and not want to help these people? So today, I am proud. This is the hardest vote I have taken in my entire career. But you know what? I go to sleep at night, and I sleep very well. The people that say no have no solutions. They just say no. Well, that's very good, and people like to hear that. But you know what? What does no mean? It means nothing. It means the same. So today I am proud I'm going to be voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next up, I want to call up uh, a colleague who uh, helps so many people, and uh, her heart is always in the right place. And she uh, has been dealing with a lot of issues locally. We saw the horrendous murders take place in her district recently, and she was there in the aftermath. Uh, someone who I respect very much. I want to call up Councilmember Margaret Chen. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, I want to thank you for your leadership and your support throughout this whole process. And as my colleague said earlier, the four of us, at least we can stay together, Diana, Karen, Steve, and give each other support. You know, two years ago when this independent commission on New York City criminal justice and incarceration led by advocates who lived the experience in the criminal justice system issue a report with a goal that many thought was impossible, the closure of Rikers Island. And then from that report came the plan to shut down Rikers and shift to smaller system, a modern service center facility 
located closer to the courts. That makes a lot of sense. And I understand the passion felt by those in my community and throughout the city who fundamentally disagree with the mayor's plan. For Chinatown, it's helpful to remember that the Manhattan Detention Center has coexisted with the neighborhood for decades. And the plan for 124 and 125 White Street will not create a new jail, but will transform the MDC into a more humane and safe facility. This is a critical step that we cannot skip on any path to close Rikers Island. Still, of course, there was no doubt it was not a perfect process. The lower Manhattan community had asked for a stronger plan that addressed the impact of construction of the surrounding neighborhood and on our senior who happened to be right next door. From the beginning, I urged City Hall to address my concern and my constituents' concern. But the duty as a city council member cannot end just at the edge of the district. Some decision demands more. The vote before us today certainly does. It represents a once in a lifetime chance to once and for all condemn the moral stain that is Rikers Island to the history book. We can no longer tell those who are trapped in a horrific cycle of incarceration to wait. We must turn the page now. And, you know, our efforts has to continue. This is not the end, it's really only the beginning. Our effort to deepen investment for the marginalized community, hold the administration accountable to the community's concern, and end the broken policy that roots in punishment and oppression and not rehabilitation. We will continue to work harder than ever. Look, this decision is a decision that's personal to so many of us in many different ways. And I firmly believe that closing Riker now is the right decision. So I will be supporting this plan today. And I thank you again to the speaker and to my colleagues for their support. And the earlier legislation the speaker was talking about, it really will help us cut down the population of the detainees. We need to provide the services people need. If they have illness and they have mental health illness, the judge, the lawyers, they should know. They should not be locked up. They should get the treatment that they need. Thank you. And next, I want to call up a very close friend of mine and someone. There was, a, I think, Sally Goldenberg tweeted yesterday, uh, boy, things have changed at the city council because the land use committee vote was delayed for 90 minutes yesterday. And I can tell you why the vote was delayed yesterday. The reason why the vote was delayed yesterday is because Steve Levin would not agree to move forward until he got an additional $10 million for restorative justice for young people who have been justice involved in New York City. He has been on the phone with me at midnight every single night the last three weeks talking about how we deepen our investments in housing, in uh, people who need mental health care. He literally has been a dog with a bone talking about what do we do. And part of the reason why we have over $300 million in new criminal justice investments is because of Steve's total and complete tenacity throughout this entire process. I am very, very proud of him. And I want to call up Councilmember Steve Levin. Thank you, Speaker. I think maybe Sally's tweet referenced that uh, I used to hold up the land use committee vote for three or four hours, so I'm, I'm down to 90 minutes at this point. Um, so uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank I want to thank the speaker um, and his staff um, for taking on this issue um, with such a sense of purpose and professionalism um, and decency and compassion. Uh, for our fellow New Yorkers, um, that it really guided the process. It guided the process in a way that allowed um, uh, council members uh, to deliberate freely, 
Uh, it allowed for uh, community members across the city to uh, speak their mind and have their voice heard. And, um, and it allowed for a real debate um, about what we do moving forward in New York City and how that reflects our values. And um, that was made possible by the speaker's uh, magnanimous leadership and, um, and, 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 um, and real decency at heart. So thank you, speaker. Um, uh, my, my, uh, my fellow uh, council members, um, and I include Danny in this as well, um, uh, Diana, uh, Margaret, uh, Karen, um, I, I can't think of uh, anybody else that I would like to be associated with um, uh, during this process. Um, uh, throughout, throughout, you have um, I've looked towards um, what the right and decent thing to do is and how to help the most people in the ways that we can uh, using, using the, our own abilities that we have here, um, how to do the most good for the most people. And uh, it's, it's, it's very admirable what you have done. And I thank you. Um, as has been said, this is a historic step forward in our city. The vote that we take today is going to affect communities for generations, um, and it will start us on a path to a more equitable and just treatment of our fellow New Yorkers. A vote to close Rikers Island and move to a smaller borough-based system today is a result of years of advocacy by people who have lived firsthand the tortures of the jail. Um, and this, the leadership in this council uh, initially led by our former speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, um, has, been, uh, has, has listened to those voices. It is the formerly incarcerated leaders who have uh, changed the narrative and held the elected officials accountable, and our city owes them immense amount of gratitude. We can't wait any longer to close Rikers Island. The unconscionable treatment of people detained at the jail, the outdated and inhumane conditions, and the severe isolation of an island away from family members and legal services necessitates that we close it as soon as we can. The campaign to close Rikers has also always been about more than just closing down the physical structure. It is about reshaping our system to one that invests in and supports communities instead of one that relies on incarceration and pretrial detention. It's truly incredible to see how far we have come in our thinking, and I have been heartened by the conversations that we are having to push for a new way forward. We have been tasked with a larger vision for change and an opportunity to make jail a last resort in New York City. And at the start of this process, we recognized that significant work was needed to get there. And through ongoing community engagement and roundtables and forums with directly impacted leaders, local residents, advocates, community justice experts, and social services providers, we were able to secure the following changes that got us to where we are today. First, we dramatically reduced the number of people that will be arrested and detained in New York City. The closure of Rikers is rooted in decarceration and requires that we push ourselves further on community justice reform. We thank, thanks to changes at the state and local level, we will be able to reduce the number of incarcerated people to 3,300 by 2026. That is down from 12,000 just a few years ago and is the lowest jail population in New York City has seen in generations. In a city of 8.7 million people, this reduction is momentous and is closer to full decarceration than any other city in the US. Um, the resolutions that we are passing today are um, instrumental in allowing us to uh, have accountability for this process moving forward. And we realize that uh, we need to earn the trust of New Yorkers and making sure that what we say is happening today is actually going to happen in reality in the coming years. Um, in addition, we are investing in communities that are harmed by incarceration and shifting towards a system that provides resources instead of jail time. Ending a system based on criminalization demands that we replace it with something better. Programs, housing, and supportive services are needed to address the root causes of why people are put into the carceral system in the first place. And so today we are committing to real dollar investments in our communities to address our city's housing, social services, 
health care, and community justice needs. This includes uh, funding for new uh, transitional and supportive housing, as the speaker said, uh, mental health crisis response teams and respite centers, and increased funding for cure violence programs citywide. I'm particularly proud of the, uh, of the uh, funding, as the speaker referenced, that we secured for restorative justice programming. Informed by the leadership of people like Miriam Kaba and da Danielle Sarad, restorative justice offers us the ability to achieve real healing and accountability for violent crimes. If we provide the opportunity for accountability rather than punishment, we create the potential for restoration for both the victim and the offender to take a step forward in healing our communities, and that is how we shift away from a culture of incarceration. Um, the council will be investing $10 million over the coming years for, justice, for restorative justice programs with an increased focus on community-based rather than just court-based solutions for misdemeanor and felony level cases. You know, these investments are going to move us dramatically closer to a world that does not rely on incarceration as a primary response to someone who's in need of support and will provide critical resources to keep people out of the criminal justice system entirely. Um, I'm very proud to be voting yes on this application today. Um, and this has been an effort that I have looked at. <clears throat> a lot of the individuals who have come to our hearings and met with us who have experienced firsthand the horrors of Rikers Island. Um, I think about Khalif Browder and the horrors that he experienced at Rikers Island and countless countless other people. Um, and we do this in their name because for far too long um, we have let Rikers stand in our name and as a reflection of our society. And we have to say once and for all, no more, no more. We need to move forward. Thank you. And I want to allow uh, my good friend, Councilmember Drum, to say a few words. He was literally the first elected official in the city of New York to call for the closure of Rikers Island. He had visited many, many times Stanley Richards, who is uh, on the Board of Correction and is a senior executive at the Fortune Society, which helps so many formerly incarcerated people. The reason why he's on the Board of Corrections is because of Danny Drum. Danny wanted a formerly incarcerated person on the Board of Corrections, and Speaker Mark Viverito helped make that happen. Uh, I am so proud of Danny. When we are in the room uh, negotiating the city's budget, Danny is always talking about formerly incarcerated people in every single conversation and how to help them. He has been a leader on this longer than maybe anyone else on the entire city council, so I want to allow him to make a few words, say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. I also didn't expect to speak here today. I was going to speak upstairs. Um, but I do want to um, um, acknowledge what you said earlier, which is the courage that it takes for these four council members to take a jail into their own community. We all know how controversial that can be. So I want to thank them for doing this and for standing up and for saying yes to it. But I also want to thank you for the courage that you uh, have to move this forward as the Speaker of the City Council. You mentioned before that. One, one council member is not term limited here. All of these, a lot of the council members may have a political future ahead of them, and, and so I hope you do too. But you have shown tremendous courage in moving this forward, and I applaud you and thank you. Uh, you know, nine years ago, when I first visited Rikers Island, the conditions there were deplorable. Um, I was the only one who spoke out about the conditions. Uh, undeterred, I joined with, my, uh, with tireless advocates, including many survivors, and all of us owe a debt of gratitude to them for helping us reach uh, this point today. May the closure of Rikers Island only strengthen our resolve to transform the entire system for the benefit of all involved, including those who work for the department and the general public. Most important are the individuals who, in steadily decreasing numbers, will be held in modern facilities focused on preparing them for re-entry. Sadly, it is too late for many people who have already been victims of Rikers Island. I want to call the attention to those who have died or who have been tortured on Torture Island, Rikers Island. Khalif Browder, the child who was tortured to the point of suicide. Leileen Polanco Extravaganza, the transgender woman who died in solitary confinement. 
Jerome McDow, who baked to death in his cell, and I visited that cell, and I saw where he died, and I felt the heat still pouring down weeks after he was in that cell. Rolando Perez, Jr., who was denied medication and left for dead after he had a seizure. Jason H. Avaria, who was ignored after eating a packet of powdered detergent that was given to detainees to clean out the sewage flooded cells. Ronald Spear, who begged to see a doctor but was reduced instead to being beaten by corrections officers. And my friend, who was on Rikers Island and who was dealing with a lifetime mental illness, as it, your brother was also. And that's what motivated me to want to do this. And to the countless New Yorkers who have known firsthand the brutality of Rikers Island, today is an historic day, and I thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> Um, uh, in addition, there is a pre-considered resolution on the filing of a land use application regarding Rikers Island, which authorizes the City Council, for the first time I believe in the City Council's history, to file a land use application amending the city map to, estab to establish a public place with a use restriction on Rikers Island. The restriction is that Rikers Island shall not be used for the incarceration of individuals after December 31st, 2026. I will have more to say at the stated meeting uh, about closing Rikers Island, but I'm very happy, of course, what we're doing today. It is the right thing to do. Uh, we've said what damage mass incarceration has done to our country and to our city. We can't undo the mistakes of the past, but we don't have to keep repeating them before. I go to questions. I want to uh, highlight some of the uh, staff who have just worked tirelessly on this. Uh, I want to thank Raju Mann, the director of uh, our land use division. I want to thank Lillian Pascone from my office, Brian Crow, Alana Sivin, Jason Goldman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Regina. Uh, uh, I want to thank, uh, for, forgive me, I'm a little out of it right now, I'm emotional, uh, if I'm forgetting anyone, but the entire team, that I want to thank Latanya McKinney and Isha, I want to thank everyone who worked so hard on this, Jen Firmino from my team, I want to thank everyone for the tremendous work, <laughs> yeah, I said, said Jason Goldman, I want to thank them all for their help, uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. So, I'll, yeah, go ahead, Gloria. Thank you. Yep. Um, I want to first ask you what you have Sure. So, uh, you know, this is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do because, as I've said before, Rikers Island is a symbol of inhumanity and brutality. It is dilapidated and irredeemable. It should have been closed down decades ago, and we are living with the after effects of it uh, still today in our city. So this is the right thing to do. For colleagues that don't feel comfortable, um, you know, everyone has to make their own decisions. The, you hear, you heard very clear moral clarity from the six members that are standing here and why they've made their decision. Uh, I agree with what Councilmember Kozlowicz said. I uh, slept well last night and I will sleep well again tonight because I believe we are doing the right thing for the future of our city and I am proud of the members. Individual members have individual concerns. Throughout this process, we tried to allay some of those concerns that made sense. We weren't able to do that for everyone, but I'm very, very proud of the vote that we're taking today. Yes, she deserves an enormous amount of credit. The mayor and I met a couple of weeks ago to talk about what final negotiations would look like, and there was still 
a big divide that we needed to close in continuing to push for community investments. But I am very, very happy with where we ended up. And I'm grateful that the mayor has been supportive of this plan. He's been supportive of the members uh, who have had to deal with this. He's been a partner on pushing for these citywide community reinvestments. And uh, I'm really grateful for uh, his leadership, especially his team. I want to thank uh, particularly Emma Wolf, his chief of staff, and working with my team, Jason Goldman, and all the other folks that I mentioned, and making today possible. Our teams have been meeting almost seven days a week for the last month in, in getting to today. They were meeting late last night. They were talking again this morning. So I'm really grateful for the partnership that we've had in making this possible today. Uh, I have a policy uh, don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on folks. People don't have to yell. I'll call on folks. Uh, yeah, yes. We have the vote's not for another 90 minutes. <laughs> Well, it's a moving target, um, and the really big driver of getting the numbers down is the criminal justice reforms that were done at the state level uh, earlier this year. With the bail reform law, uh, it is, uh, you know, pretty well predicted that that number was going to go closer to 4,000 people. And to give context, as Steve mentioned earlier, uh, you know, in 1990, we were at 22,000 people who were incarcerated in New York City. About five years ago, we were at 12,000 people incarcerated in New York City. Today, we're about 7,000 people who are incarcerated in New York City. And we think with the bail reform laws and enhancing supervised release, which this package does today, we're increasing the funding for supervised release from $17 million, which was funded in, the, in last year's budget uh, to uh, 54 million dollars in supervised release. For people that don't know is a judge being able to make a decision to not send that person away to jail but to have them report back before their trial uh, with some supervised uh, uh, programming and other things that are necessary. A judge could still remand people, but that is what we're seeking to do. So that will push the number down. And, and we think, and it's very likely, that the state legislature, which enacted these reforms earlier this year, uh, we hope this year is going to pass the Less is More Act. And the Less is More Act is going to ensure that people that have technical uh, parole or probation violations are not sent back to Rikers Island. I visited Rikers Island uh, last week. Uh, Councilmember Ayala was with me, Councilmember Levin was there, Councilmember Drum was there, Councilmember Chin and Kozlowitz weren't able to make it that day. We didn't tell the press we were going, we didn't tweet about it, we walked around for four hours and talked to people who were on Rikers Island. And a number of people who were there are there on technical parole violations. The Less is More Act would probably decrease the number by an additional, we think, six to eight hundred people that would bring the number down even farther. So we feel pretty good about where these numbers are. We think it's the right number. Our team on the council side did a lot of analysis. The mayor's office of criminal justice did a lot of analysis. We took in crime trends. I mean, crime trends are, are basically 10, 20, 30 year trends. Uh, when you look at what's happened and when you look at the money we're putting in, the $300 million, enhancing supervised release, the Less is More Act, and all these other things, we think that is the right number. Well, you know, the facilities are going to be built to uh, have the capacity, we, the capacity is going to be a little bit bigger than 3,300, but that's what we think because you need to build a little bit of excess capacity uh, in case there is that. But we feel like the number is going to go down. Uh, we, we're happy to share our analysis with you. We're happy to share the analysis with the press that both Mock J did and the council did to show you how we arrived at that number. That's why we feel so good about it. I can't go into all the technical analysis right now, but our team has spent literally months and months and months on this to get this to the right number. Noah? How does it feel kind of being targeted by the left that's not progressive on this? I mean, some of the people in Nomi Jez, what would you say to them specifically today about where you think? We are the most, this will make us the most decarcerated city in the United States of America. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the over $300 million that we're putting in community investments to divert people from the justice system and to help people who are re-entering and trying to reintegrate into society. And you cannot put people, there are going to be people who are remanded. There are going to be people who are going to be remanded to jail, no matter what happens. 
And for those people who are remanded, they should not be on Rikers Island. And the existing facilities, the Brooklyn House of Detention, the barge, and the tombs are worse than Rikers Island. They are worse than Rikers Island, those buildings. So you cannot rehabilitate those buildings. You cannot make them better. It is not possible. If this was about just fixing those buildings up, why wouldn't we have done that? It just doesn't make sense. So I laud the goals of pushing us for community investment, for having the conversation about mass incarceration. I think it's important that they continue to push us to do better, but I think we're dealing with the reality of the situation, and I think that is a fundamental flaw, is that you cannot make those three sites better. Uh, we'll go to the gut. Yeah, sorry, I'll go to you ask, next. Sorry, no. I just, just want to add a couple of um, backup backing points to what Corey just said. Um, if you think about uh, an analogous city, Los Angeles, Los Angeles County has 10.5 million people, and they incarcerate, I believe, 22,000 people in Los Angeles County jails. Um, 22,000. Uh, we are looking at uh, a city of 8.7 million people, and in five or six years, looking at 3,300. Um, so, you know, we are so far ahead of where other cities are actually, and even where we're starting from, obviously. We're at a third of the number of people incarcerated in just uh, about 80% of the population. So that's one thing. The second thing is, from the outset, I said, just as, as Corey made reference, the Brooklyn House of Detention cannot be improved. It can't be expanded. It cannot be, um, uh, rehabilitated as a building. It's from the 1950s. Um, uh, it is so far out of date. It is absolutely out of compliance with any uh, regulatory framework or any in terms of minimum amount of space for There's people no that are detained. There's no air conditioning. It is, I mean, I've, I've been there in the past month. It is physically worse than any of the three jails that I've been on Rikers Island in the last month. It is just physically unfit for people to be uh, habitated. And the one other thing I'll say, no, and then I'll go to you. The one other thing I'll say is, you know, we, this entire plan from the very beginning before I became speaker under Speaker Mark Viverito and over the last two years, uh, formerly incarcerated people have been at the table with us throughout the entire conversation. Just Leadership USA, um, Catal, the Vera Institute of Justice, the Osborne Association, all these groups which for years and years and years have been pushing for policies that will fight the scourge of mass incarceration and to actually rehabilitate people. These are the people that have been doing this work and they were at the table with us throughout this plan. If you saw the vote yesterday, the people who were formerly incarcerated were literally crying after Adrian Adams at the subcommittee spoke. They are here today. This is an emotional day for them. They have been part of the conversation all along, and I'm really, really proud of that. Yes, sir. Well, I think we have to look at the numbers is, is the key thing and not base it on uh, anecdotes and not play into fear, but to say that this year we're beating homicide numbers from last year. That doesn't mean there aren't certain neighborhoods in New York City that we need to do more community investments, that we have to help people with uh, violence disruption and do the cure violence model. We should do that. But the number of homicides this year is the lowest number ever recorded in the history of New York. And people similarly in 2012 and 2013 made the same argument on why we should continue stop, question, and frisk, which was a racist policy that divided our city. People are always going to use fear tactics. It is important for us to take a step forward. We are seeing what criminal justice reform looks like. The state legislature took that big step earlier this year. We have been working with the experts, with the pros. Judge Lippman, who was the 
chief judge in New York who has worked in the court system for decades in New York City chaired this panel and came forward with a very thoughtful plan on how to get this done. He is not someone who is not an expert in the law and on crime trends. We got John Jay involved. Everyone has been involved. So people are going to try to use scare tactics. People are going to try to say we should keep things the same. It is difficult to effectuate change sometimes. People are afraid of change. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have crime in New York City. We are going to have crime, but we need to get to the root of that crime. We need to push for housing and mental health and cure violence. We know these programs work. We know it. And what you see right now is a lot of the violent crime in New York City is crime that you're seeing from communities that have seen years of disinvestment and not the level of social service programming and violence disruption programming that they need. Instead of having a young man join a gang in New York City, we want to give that young man other options. We want to give that young man other things to do. And that is what today is about, moving away from an overly punitive system and doing the right thing. I am very proud of what we're doing. Noah? Let me uh, tell you exactly. So in the points of agreement, there w there's $391 million. $126 million of that 391 was previous already budgeted investment that we have been doing for the last few years in anticipation of this. There is $265 million today in new investments brand new investments that we negotiated as part of this land use, land use action. And I think you saw, hopefully you saw the press release that was sent out detailing what those are. Some of those things we put in the November plan. Some of those things we put in the preliminary budget plan. Some of these things will be multi-year scaled up investments where you'll see part of the money come in and the next adopted budget and part of the money come in in the previous fiscal year. So it depends on the program. We literally went program by program with the community-based organizations that are going to be doing a lot of this work with Mock J, which is administering a lot of this work and seeing what the capacity was to actually get all of it done. And that's why some of it needs to be rolled out in a multi-year way. And $40 million, it didn't get much coverage at the time, but $40 million is what the council fought for and advocated for, and we actually put it in ourselves in the June budget. We put in a bunch of money for mental health, we put in a bunch of money for supportive housing, we put a bunch of money in for people who are involved in the sex trade to give them support services. So $40 million was the June budget, $265 million is this deal, that's $305 million, and then there is $126 million in previously budgeted criminal justice related work that we've been doing in the years leading up to this. We can give you the exact breakdown on each program line by line on when it's going to get budgeted, when it's going to get rolled out. It's different program by program. So it's over a period of several years. It's not a new annual commitment of $391 million a year. Some of, it will be, some of it will be immediate. Some of it will be phased in. It depends on the program. Okay. Uh, well, if you look at the Lipman Commission report in the first chapter, they had called for $260 million in community investment. So we're actually getting far above that in over $300 million. So again, they, uh, they're the ones that came up with what they thought the appropriate amount of community investment was, and that's a number that we were shooting for uh, the entire time. Uh, do I think that this is fair compensation? I would not say that you could say it's proper or fair compensation, but the investments and policy changes secured as part of these negotiations, I think, are giant steps forward in the city's criminal justice reform efforts, as is closing Rikers Island. The two efforts go hand in hand, and we can't make false comparisons like this that doesn't help anyone. Uh, technically speaking, the annual cost of each when converting capital to debt service is pretty close. We're going to see also a lot of savings from the Department of Corrections when you uh, downsize to borough-based facilities. So, you know, uh, I, think, I think we, again, I said when I started, we're not going to solve everything here today. 
We are still going to try to push for additional support of housing, additional uh, treatment for people who are seriously mentally ill in the upcoming budget. We got fair fares in my first seven months as speaker to help people who are living in poverty so that they don't have to jump the turnstile. These are things we do. You build on top of these things in each budget cycle and each time an issue comes up, and that's what we're doing here today. Sydney? I, I hope that the uh, newly elected members that replace three of the members here today will be people who are committed to doing the right thing. And I think you're going to have these three members work to ensure that whoever their successor is, is someone that is going to be on board with uh, sticking with uh, us doing the right thing here. Uh, we're doing this map change on Rikers Island, uh, and the only way to undo that is if a future city council and a future mayor decided to do that. Uh, that is a tough thing to do uh, when the plan will already start. Uh, and so, uh, you know, is everything always foolproof? No, but we are trying to make this as tight as possible to actually start with these facilities and close Rikers Island down in the tightest way that we think is doable. Rich? We feel confident that this is the right size. If you look at crime trends and you look at the last 30 years, you are going from 22,000 in 1990 to 12,000 five years ago to 7,000 today. And with these new investments that we are making, which we know affects people from not being put in the criminal justice system and the changes that were made at the state level, it's, uh, it, it, would, it would be, um, totally out of line with the facts and what we're seeing to think that is going to happen. So I, I, you know, it is hypothetical in some ways, and I feel very confident, and we're, again, we're happy to share our analysis of how we arrived at that number, what factors we took into consideration. If that changed, a future administration, a future mayor would have to look at that. But again, we didn't want to overbuild these facilities. You didn't want to build excess capacity. You wanted to build the facilities in the way that you thought the numbers were going to add up. And that's what we did. Uh, we can do off topic as well if anyone has questions. Yes, Beth. You know, I think what you've heard, and Beth, your question I think very much in line with some of the formerly incarcerated folks that we've been working with throughout the process. And, you know, they say if you treat a new house differently, uh, then, you know, you, you, you need to actually change the way you treat people inside the facilities. And the current facilities are falling apart. Their layout is extremely difficult to, difficult to conduct meaningful programming with the community-based organizations that do this work. And I don't think you can be serious about changing the culture of violence within DOC, within the existing uh, structures. So part of what needs to happen is we do need to change the culture on Rikers Island. You've seen the council in the last six years have multiple hearings about the culture of violence on Rikers Island and in the correction system. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, people get the training that they need. The, you've seen the Department of Investigation come out with multiple reports. You have a consent decree uh, on Rikers Island right now because of the massive amounts of violence. So we need to actually uh, change the culture, but also there's a lot of people on Rikers Island that shouldn't be there. 
There's a lot of people who are suffering from mental illness that shouldn't be on Rikers Island. And I think when you change a bunch of those dynamics by further decarcerating and getting people in appropriate facilities, like in therapeutic facilities, diverting them from the system, that's going to help. When you drive the number down and you do additional training and you do the work you need to do, I think you're gonna see some change. Steve, did you wanna say anything on this? I think you, you were talking about this before. No? Uh, okay, okay. We off. Uh, on a different topic, I wanted to ask you about school busing. Um, yep. I know the council had a couple of hearings last year before the school board was going to be closed. And I know the council had a couple of hearings last year because there was some uh, major issues. And I think last September actually had the most bus delays of any prior year. Um, this year, as it turns out, this, uh, certainly when it comes to special education buses, there are more delays even than last year. Um, the DOE did implement GPS devices, but they're not accessible. And not on every bus. And, and I guess I, I just want to see what, what more can and, and will the council do on this? Well, you know, we had a, a hearing uh, earlier this year uh, talking about how problematic the busing issue is. And you saw a bill by Councilmember Kalos that was requiring GPS on all buses that was supposed to be up and ready for the start of the school year in September. And there were uh, thousands of buses that didn't meet the deadline and that don't have GPS. And we've seen further delays in getting children home. And so you had the chancellor at the beginning of his time as chancellor sit there with a new head of the Office of Pupil Transportation say, we're gonna fix this, we're gonna turn it around. The mayor's been asked about this. It's unacceptable. People need to know where their children are. And the Department of Education is out of compliance with the council law that required the GPS to be installed before the start of the school year. So they need to fix it. They need to get it right. You've seen Councilmember Traeger continue to talk about this on almost a weekly basis about these issues. And the council will continue to use our oversight to figure out what is really going on why haven't they met the mark of what the chancellor and the head of the Office of Pupil Transportation said they were going to do? And when can we expect all of the buses to have GPS that are accessible to parents when they're trying to figure out why their children are not home in time from school? Who else? Rich? So, about the Carlos Jail, do you expect them all to open like on one day? No. It's going to be, be, yeah, it's going to be sequenced, you know. Uh, I think the Bronx is probably the easiest site because you don't have to do demolition. You'll have to do some remediation on that site because it's been a tow pound and you're gonna have to do some foundation work, but it's not the same as actually tearing a building down, which you're gonna have to do in three of the other sites. So the sequencing, I don't have the exact sequencing with me. The administration and the council, our land use division have been going back and forth on the sequencing of it. It's my hope that if one of those facilities uh, opens up earlier than another facility, that we can actually start to see jails demolished on Rikers Island, uh, you know, and that would happen simultaneously so you could actually see those jails coming down with the new jails going up. Noah? Last question. Speaking of demolition, do you have any idea, if the vote passes today, when demolition would begin in Brooklyn and Queens? We have some documents we can share with you. Some of it has to do with the site conditions of each site. DDC, the Department of Design and Construction, has been doing initial work with the Department of Buildings to figure out what the conditions are. So I don't have it in my head, but we have been working on this timeline. It's been part of our conversation. Is Raju here? Did Raju leave? OK, we can get it for you, Noah. Uh, yes? I think the conversation has changed nationally. I think the conversation has changed here in New York City, and I think there was a lot of courage and bravery on the part of my predecessor, Speaker Mark Viverito, in taking this step and appointing the Lippman Commission and having that commission meet and make this recommendation. You saw that there were a bunch of folks that weren't on board when the Lippman Commission made that recommendation, but then we continued to see the conversation change in New York City and change nationally, so I think that had something to do with it, um, definitely. Anyone else? Yeah. Noah? Yeah. And then lower than summer.
board here proposing to add to the record site, and they argue that, you know, what's to stop a sister city council from, from reversing that? Um, I, just, I wonder what your... I, no, I don't, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, 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 this is the first I've heard this. I mean, we, we can come up with conspiracy theories. We are closing Rikers Island. We are opening up better jails that are gonna be more humane, that are gonna have spaces for programming, that are gonna have heat and air conditioning, that are gonna do these things. You know, let's, again, let's not get twisted. Let's not be loose with the facts. I'm happy to have, I'm, hap I'm happy to have the land use division. I could just speak to that really I mean, quickly, which is, is. My question essentially is, what's to stop a future city council nothing. from changing their mind? But, and so, and so, but they, a future city council, keep in mind, would have to vote to reopen Rikers Island. That's what that vote would be. So I don't think, and I can't, I don't have a crystal ball, I can't see in the future, but I, I don't believe that sometime between 2022 and 2026, there will be a city council that w in, in New York City that will be willing to vote to reopen Rikers Island, because that's what that vote would be. Summer? Is Regina here? Regina, come here for a second. So the, the, come on up here. So the new funding, some of it's gonna be, some of it we're gonna see in the November plan? Yes. Some of it we'll see in the November plan. Yes. Some of it we'll see in prelim. The November plan is a multi-year plan, but some of the, um, some of the programs that will take multi-year to the will show money in the, in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, today is uh, Spirit Day. No, National Coming Out Day. Oh, National Coming Out Day. <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, give me five gay demerits. I don't know. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>